Welcome to the Church Collective Podcast. In this episode, myself and Chris had the opportunity to talk to Chris McClarney from Jesus Culture, and he is just an incredible guy, and I, I think you're going to really, really appreciate We got into just a lot of really candid stuff about just uh, doing ministry and about mental health and the importance of being open and honest with your lead pastor and just what that means and, and, and all that in the context of worship ministry. So I think you're absolutely going to love it. I also wanted to take a quick moment and let you know that we keep doing these Zoom hangs. We had a worship leader one as I'm recording this last week and it was really cool. We have a guitar and gear one where we're having David Leota from Elevation Worship join us. So if you're listening to this and that already happened, just head over to the churchcollective.com and hit that Zoom hang button. We have another worship one coming up in October, but we're trying to put these together for all kinds of aspects of worship ministry. So make sure you go check that out. Again, you hit the Zoom Hangs button on the churchcollective.com. Uh, that's enough of that. So let's jump straight in with this chat with Chris McClarney. Uh, every Sunday night for five weeks um, at the JC Church in Sacramento, we recorded uh, live worship sets and we were just supposed to make the one CD so we we're going to take all the best songs that we recorded, but I guess they all turned out good enough, and we made them made them into two. Uh, but yeah, on the first record, I wrote a couple of tunes. Uh, one Kim sang called "Insatiable," and one that I sang called "Revival." And then uh, on the newest record, I've got a couple more tunes that I'm singing both. Uh, I forget what we ended up calling it. One's it's either more than anything or I need you. Uh, yeah. It might be I need you parentheses more than anything. Uh, I, we, we went back and forth on what we should call it for forever. And then the other one is Lean Back, which is a song that I wrote with uh, House Fire guys and Amanda Cook from Bethel. And yeah. That's really cool. So how, were you involved in like picking which songs went to like had talked to me about how did you what was the decision made to like make two albums out of the thing? Was that just like, Oh, okay, cool. Well, we got an email that said, all right, guys, uh, just between, uh, Jeremy who runs the label and produced the record, um, and the capital guys, and then all of the Jesus culture artists. And it said, guys, we've got too many songs. Like there's like, like, I think at the time there was like 18 songs. I don't know what we whittled it down to, but it was like, Hey, we've got 18 songs and we need to figure out how we're going to do this. And uh, everybody kind of put in their vote. Like, do we take the best songs or do we uh, put out both records? I was kind of on the uh, let's just put out the best songs bandwagon. But <laughs> sure. uh, I got I got outvoted, which is fine <clears throat> there. And now I'm glad we did it because some of these songs um i just feel like songs for right now it's such a weird world we're living in right now and yeah. it feels like some of these songs are just made for now so yeah talk to us about like how is jesus culture operating nowadays i know uh, we were just talking to james duke and he was telling me that you're you're the worship pastor at church of the city correct yeah that's right yeah so yeah. i didn't I didn't know that because that's in Nashville, if people don't know. And then Jesus Culture is still in Sacramento, is it? Yeah, that's in Sac. So how, with I kind of everybody like spreading out, like how does it operate now? Right. Um, first of all, James Duke is like my best friend. I love him so much. I'm going to give a shout out. <laughs> he's the best. Um, okay. He's so fun. Uh, well, they've when they years ago were the youth group at Bethel, and started recording we were just friends so i was just friends with the band guys and they uh specifically myspace friends so that shows you how long ago it was <laughs> and, and um and on myspace the sound guy from my church would upload like recordings of our sunday morning worship set to myspace and my friends who they were just a youth group. They weren't recording anything yet, but they would listen to the MySpace songs. And when they wanted to record, I had only written two songs at the time and they recorded one for their first record. And then your love never fails uh, for their second record, I think. And, uh, and so that when your love never fails came out, 
it kind of sealed our friendship because that song blew up and it was like, this is amazing. These are my best friends. They like, and it was like, I would go out and lead worship at the events, but I wasn't in the band, but we always talked about like, we should make music one day. And then about, gosh, I guess it's been 10 years ago now. It was like, Hey, should we do this? Should we actually make some music together? So we did. We made uh, made a record together that was a me record. And we had so much fun doing it that they just let me start traveling with them. And then that turned into me singing like one song on their record. And then it was two songs on their record. And it's just kind of grown from there to now they accept me fully as one of their own. But it was very organic and sneaky. But all that to answer your question, the reason why I'm not out there is because it real organically became me and the band. They're all still out there with the exception of um, James, who plays on a lot of the records, and Josh, the drummer, both live here in Nashville and play with me at church. Um, so I stole a couple of guys, which I'm proud of. Um, but yeah, that's uh, practically speaking. Um, all of the other guys are out there and invested in that church full time. And then uh, I, I kind of uh, am at my church here in Franklin church of the city and, um, and just meet up with them. And plus a lot of the tours leave from Nashville anyway. So they'll fly in and I'll hop on the bus. Actually, I've got it better than they do. West coast tours are the worst. So because of having to fly and you don't ever get to come home, but, Leaving out of Nashville, you're gone for four days and then back home. And so it works out good for me. So James was James is playing on that? Yeah, James is playing on the new record, uh, both volumes. James has played on uh, the last few records and also has toured with us for the last all the and he he goes out with me uh, on all the gigs that I've done for Again, he's literally he's like my best friend. I, I talk to him every day. Um, so, yeah, he's he's definitely playing on most of the stuff that we're putting out. He played on all the Kim stuff. He played on my records. Uh, yeah. I mean, he's James Duke. He, he does. He does it all. He's the man. <laughs> what other musicians uh, are on there? Um, well, all of the JC guys, uh, that are normally on records with the exception of Josh didn't play on this. Uh, he, uh, got a new job at the church that I'm at here in Franklin. So Josh, the drummer's not on it, but Brandon and Jeffrey, uh, Ian's not playing on this record either. Uh, he plays keys on a lot of the old ones and, uh, Trey, uh, is the guy's name who played keys on this. Um, and he's, Trey's been kind of, cause Ian's got a whole other business that he's running. So Trey has been touring with us a lot and, uh, yeah, it just felt natural. It, it wasn't weird. None of it was weird, but yeah, we, we did lose a couple of the players that would have normally played. <clears throat> are they, um, are they all from the same venue? Like the, the recordings or was it? Yeah. Different? So we recorded, we recorded every night. Uh, Sunday night at the JC church, which okay. is, they meet at Folsom high school. Um, and yeah, I think with the exception of, uh, Chris's song, which we had to come back and record because his daughter actually had a seizure. It ended up being mild, but had a seizure, uh, the night we were supposed to record, which was crazy. And, uh, made the whole experience just nuts. I mean, we were praying for her and, and for him, it was just, it ended up being not a big deal. It was not a deal at all. Like she's fine. And, but it meant that he missed that recording night. It, mm -hmm. it literally happened when we were sound checking. So I think oh, wow. with the exception of that one singular song, all the rest of it was recorded on those Sunday nights uh, in December, which was weird too to record a record in December. Everybody's thinking about Christmas and yeah. <laughs> all the radio songs are Christmas songs. And then you got to go in and try and record a anthem rock, you know, <laughs> worship record. <laughs> uh, 
uh, talk a little bit about, um, so you do touring stuff, but you're the worship pastor at your church. Could you maybe get a little tactical and like, how do you, I mean, there's obviously some discipleship involved in that. Could you talk tactically? Like how, yeah. you, how do you set yourself up to not be there on a weekend? Right. Um, well, real early on, we, our church was only about, this was six years ago. Now, when I signed up for leading worship at the church, there was like 125 people and it was like, Hey, I feel called to local church. I have a passion for local church, but I was also doing the Jesus culture thing and had come off of, uh, kind of a large church staff to be able to do that. And so I, it was just a scratch and itch, like being involved in local church and having the anchor there. And so we talked about it way up front where it was like, Hey, like when, you know, I still need to do the travel thing, but I feel called to local church. And so we worked it all out on the front end that I would kind of be able to juggle these two things Since then, the church in the last six years has grown to, you know, probably closer to 6,000 people. And so along the road, in order to maintain me being able to juggle both things, we brought in another worship leader who leads. uh, We co-lead a lot, and then he leads when I'm not there. His name is John Reddick. He's a black guy, and we uh, part of that goal was... Me and him had a hard to kind of merge the culture, and definitely helps carry that load. And then now that we're a big church, we've got you know a whole staff of people that help fill in the blanks when we need it. Uh, but you know, tactically, it is hard because I juggle uh, Jesus culture, and then we recorded a record as Church of the City, oh, wow. uh, which was a big part of juggling. And then I write songs for other people to sing uh, and juggling all those and being a dad. And uh, it made for a pretty stressful, I don't know how deep or serious you guys get on your podcast, but it made for a super stressful uh, end of last year where we were recording my church record and recording the Jesus culture record. And, uh, and I had just, uh, a month before had recorded my EP and also my wife had gotten, she has Crohn's disease and had lost about 40 pounds and was in the hospital. And I ended up having what I thought was a heart attack, ended up in the mm-hmm. hospital thinking I was dying yeah. and, uh, just turned out it was panic. And, uh, so yeah, I, all that to say you, you ask like, tactically how it works i don't know if i figured it out yet because i kind of <laughs> melted down at the end of last year and sure. and really really feel like i i broke a little bit and um and so this year i we we've really tried to uh i took all of january off sabbatical would be a spiritual word for it but i just took it off i didn't leave worship at church i didn't travel and i just tried to get my my heart and my brain right and reconnect with family and uh and then uh i was supposed to come out of that and be like all right let's take on the world and then the world shut down so uh uh, which has all sorts of its own stresses but has made the juggling a little bit easier because i'm not traveling i'm not um doing the touring thing and uh, and i am able to just focus on doing whatever this new version of church is online trying to figure that out and then lots of family time so in some ways this has been super good for me it was it was really good to uh just pull the plug on everything really and and our church offices are closed so i'm not even able to go out there during the week so this has been uh honestly it's probably been a real healthy transition i mean it's had its own stresses obviously um but yeah yeah, well, I appreciate your just honesty on like the the panic attack thing. Like, I love like as you're saying that. Like, I'm thinking of some worship leaders and stuff that I know. It, it feels like we often have to hide our insecurities or our, you know, the fact that stuff is stressing us out. Do you maybe have something to say for that worship leader who feels like, man, I can't tell my pastor 
that I am at my wits end with this because if I tell them that, then I'll be weak and I'll, they won't want me here. Right. right? Like you got anything for that, that worship leader. Right. Well, and I felt the same way and I felt invincible and honestly, my brain never, like I, I didn't feel stressed. Like Mm. I felt stressed. I was stressed, but I wasn't like, I was excited about things. Like I, I had, you know, uh, my EP was coming out. That was awesome. I was recording a church record, which we've been talking about. These are all really good things. And um, when I ended up in the hospital, the doctor was asking me all the questions, yeah. uh, you know, like, do you, are you stressed out a lot? And, you know, and I was like, no, I, I mean, yeah. there's a lot going on. And basically he said something that kind of changed the way I thought about it, which he, he said, it sounds like your brain and your body don't agree on how stressed you are. And I was like, Oh gosh. And I honestly, I felt like I could just keep going, but I've, I've started to try and learn to listen to what my body's saying, which is, uh, am I super tired? And, and, you know, am I tense? And, and I realized like I was acting excited on the outside and my brain was saying, you have so much to be pumped about. And my body was tense and my heart rate was up and I started taking my blood pressure and it was stupid high. Like I was over 200 and it was like dangerous. And so I think honestly, scripture talks a lot about, I mean, even God, he created the world and he's God, he could do anything. And he took a day to rest. And I think we as Christians and and think about it, man, the Ten Commandments. One of them is to rest. <laughs> like yep. one of them is to respect the Sabbath. That's like a Ten Commandment. That's one of the top ten rules we as Christians hold up. And it's the one rule that we probably break the most. We don't take time to rest. And so, yeah, uh, I think for that person that's listening to this, I I broke and I didn't think I was breaking. And, um, and I think it's important for us to proactively rest, take a moment to rest. And, and it's either you have the awkward conversation with your pastor now, or you end up in the hospital thinking you're dying and you're having to tell your pastor then why you can't (laughs) come to the staff meeting. Sure. And, um, and, and so I think. Yeah, for that person listening, you have to prioritize the rest side. It's equally as scriptural as all the other stuff is, you know, respect the Sabbath and take a day a week and rest and and then take time. I I talk to so many worship leaders that don't take their vacation days. They're like, I haven't gone on vacation in three years. It's like, what the heck are you doing? Like. (laughs) Well, it doesn't make us more spiritual to do that. It doesn't. It doesn't make us more, like it. It actually and it hinders our kingdom impact because if we're not healthy, if we're not being able to give out from an overflow, then what are we giving from? We're just making up crap at that point. And it's like we need to get filled up. We need to get rested and really pour out of an overflow as a poor, as opposed to you know, just trying to scrap stuff together. Yeah. And I don't, and I'm, I'm saying that as somebody that's feels still empty, I'm not saying I've got it figured out. You should listen to me. Right. I, I feel like I'm just trying to figure it out, but yeah. yeah. That's great. Did the doctor give you anything else other than just kind of chill out? Like, did he tell you to yeah. exercise or did, what, yeah. what did he tell you? Yeah, that was a big one. It was uh, <laughs> uh, exercise which ended up being another thing. My blood pressure was still climbing and I think Corona and all the stupid uh, stuff over the past few months kind of had uh, to do with that too. And I ended up back at the doctor's office and, um, and just talking through everything. And he's like, dude, you gotta, you gotta exercise. You gotta get out and move your body. You're just sitting on your butt all day watching Netflix and, it's, you know, you're spiraling back out of control. You're going to end up back in here. So exercise was the big thing. And then uh, sleep was a big thing. It was like, hey, you need to get eight hours of sleep. And I know it sounds dumb 
And especially I have kids. So after they go to bed, it's the only real time I have to spend, you know, doing whatever it is I wanted to do. And it's like <clears throat> prioritizing sleep and some form of exercise. I'm not running marathons, but I'm getting outside and I'm walking around the block and we got a little Corona dog. We got a puppy for <laughs> quarantine <Got> pup <laughs> to make it. <laughs> and, uh, and so I've been walking the, the puppy and, um, and doing that. And, and I do feel healthier. And then the biggest, I mean, honestly, this was the thing I was most embarrassed about, which was he wanted to put me on uh, Zoloft or I think that's what it's called. And, um, and it really helped, honestly. And I, I was like, no, I'm, I'm bigger than that. Like I have God, I don't need medicine. And, uh, and talked with my wife and honestly asked other friends of mine that, that had taken it. And, and it really helped. It helped to even out my, all of my crazy stuff in the season. And, I mean, and hopefully it's not forever. I don't want to take medicine forever, but honestly it helped. And, and it was my pride that kept me from taking it sooner. And I wish I had, you know, to be truthful. Well, and there's a stigma just about getting help in general. Yeah. Like talk to a counselor. Why is that? Why is that a thing that we feel ashamed of or weird about, or it doesn't make us less of a leader or less. It, 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 I think it actually, the people that are willing to take the risk and go see a counselor or, uh, and nowadays there's like counselors you can call on your phone and it's like taking the risk to do that is so healthy and so good for you. And yet there's this stigma that like, oh, well, he's not strong enough to handle it on his own. You know, how can yeah. he be a spiritual leader if he can't even, you know, handle his own life? And that's just, it's not true. It's not real. Like, I think it, it makes us better leaders if we admit that we're, that we need help. And if we go and, and seek it out, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Are you, um, like how you, do you moderate how much media you take in? Like as far as news with everything going on, I know I go back and forth between like being addicted to watching it and then being like, well, I need to chill out. And is that, are you aware of that with your, your anxiety? Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, exactly what you just said. I'll go through like, uh, the past week I've probably watched the news like every day, but before that I didn't, it was just like, you know, Hey, we need, I need to turn that off. It's stressing me out. It's not good news. And now I'll go back to watching, uh, impractical jokers on, you know, <laughs> just on repeat where it's just dudes doing stupid stuff to each other and uh or watching netflix tiger king whatever uh i probably <laughs> honestly i probably watch too much tv and it's not yeah. healthy uh but uh, you know it it's definitely a nice little stress reliever to watch stupid tv shows mm. um but yeah, I mean, ideally, I would watch a lot less TV and I'd create more music and other wonderful things. But um, yeah, I haven't done that. What do you now? What do you do? You said you go back and forth. What's do you have rules set up for yourselves that I didn't what are best I, practices? I didn't honestly realize that that there was a thing of like getting addicted to the news until Corona hit. And then with the social injustice thing, it just added to that. And I got to yeah. a point where I kind of realized like, man, I was so addicted to it's, it's like you kind of get addicted to bad news. And I've, I've just, I'm like, man, I got to stop watching the news for a little bit. You know, I mean, I'm not trying to be not aware of what's going on, but there is, yeah, there's so much bad news. There's so much. Yeah. That's interesting. Addicted yeah. to bad news. Am I addicted to bad news? <laughs> Gosh. You I, know what I, I love? That's that some good news thing. That's I fun. love that. <laughs> yeah. That was, I, I was crying. I don't ever cry. I was watching the John Krasinski thing and just crying at the end of it. Like, 
Oh, yeah. they gave him season tickets to see <laughs> the Red Sox. <laughs> and I'm crying. I don't even care about baseball. Or, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm pumped about it. <laughs> well, yes. It's funny you said that because I yesterday I got a friend of mine shared with me like 46 good things that have happened through this. And it, like I was scrolling through it and I just started crying. <laughs> Like, yeah. Why am I crying? Like, and I just, and I, so I showed my wife and I was like, here, watch this with me. And it's, we're by the end of it, we're both crying. You know, it's like, you, you didn't realize how much bad stuff you had taken in until you start trying to yeah. watch some good stuff. Yeah, you we got, got my number in. now from this. You need to text me that video. I need, I need <laughs> some good news. <laughs> We got stuck in a cycle at my church. I'm in California, so we've just got all the rules. And so uh, I'm on the team here where basically we were meeting every day to like unpack the local news and the California news. So like oh, I'm listening gosh. to I'm listening to our governor. I'm listening to the president. Everybody's holding the daily press briefing just to kind of like because we're just trying to figure out when we're supposed to like what are we doing? Yeah. What, like how are we able to operate? We're still kind of like one of our guys is still kind of that guy, but I had to you know, three or four weeks ago, finally, I was just like, you know what? I can't keep up with this anymore. I'm going to wait till the document shows up and then we'll just do what we got to do from there. But it is a mess. <laughs> do you want to talk oh, about the, gosh. the the church of the city <laughs> album at all too? Cause um, like we're friends with yeah. Tasha and Keith and uh, James. Yeah. And, I mean, we pretty much had everybody on the podcast. You're the only person from the Jesus culture album that we haven't had yet on the podcast. So amazing. You saved the best <laughs> for last. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the Church of the City record was um, super fun. I yeah, we put a lot of that was all homegrown. The whole goal was uh, on my part from when I showed up. I mean, we're in Nashville, so everybody's always saying you should record a CD. Your church worship is awesome. My whole goal, I felt like it was my job was to pump the brakes on it. Like, let's not release a record just for the sake of it. Like, let's not make songs just because we're in Nashville and we can. Like, let's... So for five years, like, I drugged my feet and just was like, no, we're not going to do it this year. Like, let's not do it. And then I guess a year and a half ago, it was like, hey, I feel like there's something for us to share with the world. There's something to to give. So, um, and, and so we started writing songs with our worship team. So we'd get together and do these like day camps where we'd split into groups of three and, and we literally, our pastor, Darren would show up and he'd say, this is what I feel like God's going to be talking, what we're going to be talking about for the next year, what I feel like God's doing in our church. And here's some massive themes that will highlight through the next year. And it was like very pragmatic, like, all right, let's write a song that says this. Like uh, there's a song on it called He Lives that I sang. The whole goal was he said, all right, this Easter, this is what we're going to talk about. And can we write a song that says exactly, you know, it needs to say it is finished and it, what if it's not focused on the cross at all, but only on the resurrection? Because we do a we do a Good Friday service where we focus on the cross and the pain of that, and it's a very somber service. And then on that Sunday, Easter Sunday, it's like, can we have a song that's just resurrection focused? And so we sat down and like with people from our team, like, can we write that song? And so we wrote it for our church to sing on. So all those songs are basically songs that we wrote for our church, which was the first time in the history of me making music for the Big C Church that I'd made it so finite in my, like, what we were aiming at. And, um, and of being in Nashville, of course, we've got the best players and uh, amazing producers that are all in our church. So I know it doesn't work for everyone. We, we ended up super lucky, but I'm really proud of what we made. And it feels so personal to um, our church, church of the city. And these songs came out of that. So yeah, I'm excited about it, honestly, yeah. and excited. The best part is we, well, we had never done it before and we recorded like 
way more songs than we put on the EP. We recorded four more songs, I think, and just held them back. I've got a couple more songs that we could have put on the record, and it was like, let's just hold them back. And slow points in our story that we wrote the song. Is your church yeah. um is your church singing They'll those songs come out on Sundays? Soon. Yeah, I mean, uh now a lot of those songs are older for us because we've been singing them for a couple of years. So we don't use them uh as much as we did. I mean, when when the record released, we were proactive about trying to do a few of them every Sunday for a month, but uh, yeah, those songs were songs that we were singing at our church, with the exception of two of them, I think. We had just kind of tried out the night that we recorded, and they ended up working, so it was it was great. But uh, all the rest of them we were, we were doing uh, on Sundays and trying to re- really see what connected with the church. And we wrote a bunch of songs that didn't work, a bunch of really bad songs, honestly. Uh, and just had enough to whittle it down to some good ones. What's your method for um, recruiting players like to your church? Because it, it seems like you, you're kind of got an all-star <laughs> team now. You know, Do you just invite them for a guest appearance and then they start going to your church? <laughs> uh, gosh, we I don't know. It feels like God just sends us people uh, in – you're right. We've got an all-star team of amazing people. The biggest like issue we have is trying to juggle how to plug everybody in. I mean, we've got, uh, just on guitar alone, we've got James. Uh, we've also got Stu G. We've got Daniel Carson, who plays with uh, Tomlin. We've got Dwayne Laring, who was a Sonic Flood's original guy and Lauren Daigle's guitar player. We've got the uh, um, a whole other like ten guys that you would have definitely heard play on records, and uh, and how do we juggle all that? So <laughs> it started being like, well, let's throw two guitar players up every week. Let's throw three guitar players up. Who cares? This is going to be fun. Um, but yeah, I feel like God keeps sending us awesome players, uh, with the exception of bass we need more bass players so if if any of your listeners are here and are awesome bass players and want to move to nashville (laughs) i can't (laughs) offer you a job or even tell you you you'll for sure get in but that's what we need we need bass players (laughs) make the move (laughs) bass players are used to that though right (laughs) yeah Thank you so much for being a part of this week's episode of the Church Collective Podcast. We super appreciate you. Head over to Instagram, shoot us a DM, and like I said at the start of this episode, go hit the Zoom Hangs button on thechurchcollective.com. We would love to plug you in and hang out with you. See you later.